There's also to our website, there'll also be another link in there uh, to a Google form where if you want to make sure you're on our mailing list, you didn't, somebody else told you about, about this Zoom meeting and you want to learn more about the refuge or if you wanted to work with the friends or help us or something, uh, there's a little form you can fill out, very simple Google form, just basically asking you for your name and your email address, and we can put you on there uh, so you, you can get announcements of, of what the friends were up to and what type of events we have going on. Uh, we are going to record this meeting, uh, this presentation of Karen's. It's going to be a, it's a wonderful presentation. I've had a chance to see it already. And uh, it will be on our YouTube channel. We're still trying to get this YouTube stuff figured out, but we are slowly moving into the, uh, the age of social media. Uh, also, th there was a... Kay will, will, will put a, uh, a link in, in the chat box to Byron, Byron Stone's Flickr page. And it's his Sparrows of Central Texas. Uh, Byron is an excellent photographer. Uh, and he, he's got about 40 slides showing the different sparrows with uh, the prominent field marks, that type of uh, thing. And you will find that fl Flickr presentation very, very uh, helpful in your sparrow identification time. Okay. Uh, Paula, would you talk a little bit about becoming a friend and what the friends are, what the friends are doing, please? Oh, sure, uh, happy to do so. So um, we have a Friends of Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge group. That's a very long name, but we basically shorten it to Friends of Balcones. And we work directly with the refuge staff on a number of projects. Um, we do everything from working trails to doing environmental education. Um, we do special events. COVID's made it a little tough for us, but some of you may have been to the herpetology presentation in the fall. Uh, we've got more scheduled this year, but we're kind of waiting on Travis County to get out of stage five. We've got um, birds of prey coming up, native plants, native peoples coming up. Um, we've got um, one coming up on mindfulness in nature and doing something called nature bathing, which, um, Boy, I'm, I'm really anxious to understand what that is. But there's a lot of really great fun stuff that we do. Um, so we would just invite you to become a friend. Um, there's a lot of people from all the three counties and even further afield who do become friends. You know, they find their passion, they volunteer. There's a lot of different projects we have going on and more coming. Um, and then learning, it's an opportunity also to learn um, as we do a lot of educational programs. Um, we do things like, you know, photo strolls and learning how to use a camera to do macro photography and so forth. And then an ability to invite your friends and families to some of these events, as well as the normal events that we have. And then membership has its privileges. I mean, you'll get early notification of special events and members get to sign up first. And as we've noticed with things like Songbird Festival, Sparrow Fest, um, some of the activities we've had at the new pavilion that we built at Doskin. I mean, members, you know, they sign up and they usually get the slots. So um, we try to make it as open as possible to people, um, but memberships do get first choice on it. Um, and then we're also opening up some closed areas of the refuge uh, to special hikes um, that they will be first um, made available to members and then open up to the more general public. And I've included our website here if you're interested. And I would just encourage all of you, if you love nature, and you love getting out and exploring the wild to, to become a friend and come and have fun with us. Fred, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Just a quick reminder before I uh, introduce Karen and we start her presentation of her time with Peaceful Springs and Sparrow Fest. Uh, after we have a presentation from Karen Byron Stone, if he has enough signal, he will be zooming in on the meeting. If not, he'll just be calling in and we will get an update from him on, on what sparrows were he's seeing, how, how the quest is going, be a chance for the audience to ask him some questions. So we're going to have two question and answer periods, uh, one after Karen's presentation, and then a little bit when, when By Byron is speaking. So uh, Karen Kilfeather, 
her name is synonymous with uh, the friends and with the history of Peaceful Springs. Uh, Karen uh, pre has basically been working as a, as a wildlife manager, a consultant for different ranches, uh, for different individuals, helping them maintain their wildlife habitat st status with the, uh, uh, the local appraisal office. And uh, she is an, a very accomplished professional photographer. Uh, one of the little things she sent me, uh, her fancy uh, resume, is uh, she's also a commercial drone operator. So if you, I really thought that was pretty neat. So if you need some aerial photos taken of your property or something like that, Karen's the lady that, that can help you out with it. Uh, Karen has been a Friends member probably from, I don't know, 2005 or something like that. Uh, probably no she's been before that she, she might have even been an original member she, she's a yep. past board member on of the friends uh she's moved up to uh, up to east texas up in palestine and presently right now she's volunteering okay. at the so nature on, on, you're on a laptop correct okay you need to mute yourself uh and, and uh so she is still volunteering with the national wildlife refuges uh she loves it uh and the nice thing about Karen is she's a personal friend of my, myself and my wife, Kay. Uh, we've camped together. And what, what you will pick out during her presentation is just her ability to observe what's happening out there. I, I think she's like an Indian. She can tell you that that branch was broken and it was not broken a day before because she just notices those type of things. So. Karen, let's turn the presentation over to you. And remember, if you get any questions, type them into the chat box and Jennifer will be mo monitoring it. And Karen has a wonderful presentation for us. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Fred. And it's good to kind of touch base with all of you again. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the share screen and get this going. So hopefully the goal today will be How's that? Can you see it? Yes, we yeah. can see it. Awesome. Thanks. So, yeah, so we're going to try to do a quick history of Peaceful Springs. So you, the folks that haven't been there kind of can get a feel for it and and then try to take you out what it was like for all the Sparrow Fests we had over the years. So basically, um, the Castleberries became the owners in the early 70s. Uh, they did have some cattle with minor grazing. They used to call it their IRS herd to keep it in the ag valuation until they got interested in protecting the land and its wildlife. So they were actually the first wildlife valuation in Burnett County back in 1999. So their goal was to do ecotourism and that stuff popping up on my screen, sorry. So they were gonna do ecotourism and their goal was to uh, document everything that was on the property. I met them in 2005 when they became involved in this um, photo contest that put professional photographers with um, uh, the landowners in the hill country. So um, I started working with them in 2005 to document and, pres and preserve and just record everything on the ranch. And I mean, that meant everything. They had me out there. We were um, Stecker's Chorus Frog. Here is the um, pond down at the pavilion. Um, seasonally, we had a lot of ducks on that pond until we started getting hit with those droughts and that pond started uh, not holding water on a regular basis. So we had uh, the ringnecks and the redheads. Of course, we had a really good population of turkeys. So here's a map for those of you who have never been on Peaceful Springs and you can see why it was kind of critical in becoming part of the refuge. And it, um, it actually was purchased in 2014 by the Trust for Public Land to hold for Fish and Wildlife until they could come up with the rest of the funds. Uh, they had a lot of donations and a lot of people really wanted to help see it protected. So you can see how it's connected by Simon's, the Flying X and the Beard. And it was really surrounded by three sides. So when I say things like, uh, uh, here's the canyon, we used to call it Rattlesnake Canyon. 
here's the, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm circling, there's the, what we call the first canyon. Down here, we had a lot of springs. And this was really good golden cheek warbler habitat. Up here, we have the hilltop. That was really our good black cap vireo habitat. And down here on the, uh, the left hand is what we called the second canyon. We had our pond, that's the pond. The pavilion was down there. Uh, again, it was golden cheek warbler territory. Uh, it got its name because of all the little nooks and crannies. It had springs and fern grottos. There was always water, um, even through the worst of the drought. None of the underwater springs uh, dried up. They may have trickled, but they didn't dry up. So these are some of our, our little um, intermittent creeks and streams that flowed throughout the canyons. So here is a drone shot of the hilltop that I had talked about. This was our black cat vireo habitat. It's, um, we kind of, I guess with Chuck Sexton, we classified it as a oak juniper with a little bit of a savanna because we had a lot of native grasses. But um, we had, the, the oaks were, we didn't really have shin oak, but we had these large oaks in these bases were a lot of forbs and shrubs, you know, the agaritas, the persimmon, uh, just, just small shrubby bushes. And it kind of formed these donut holes that our black cat vireos liked. This is facing off towards uh, doe skin and 1174. So you can see we have, you know, uh, it's patchwork. And that we found was really kind of critical to all of our species because really with the clearing that's going on in the hill country, um, the birds especially need that cover on the ground for protection. This is the, the canyon down there by where the cabin used to be. Um, and this is one of the, the famous trails that Byron and Bill and Jeff would take a lot of our sparrow fest participants on. This is a really golden cheek warbler habitat too because of the canyon and the slopes. A lot of old growth juniper all up and down the canyon. Right over here uh, is the beard track. So this is uh, one of the other shots. This area was an area where we've been doing some native grass restoration. You can see the darker brown is our little blue stem. We had yellow Indian grass that kind of ran along these ditches because this hillside had a lot of seeps. So there was a mixture in here of seep muley. And you can see where we've been working our way down to get rid of the KR blue stem. And it's, uh, it was about an eight to 10 year project just plugging along. Up here in the uh, upper right is the flying X. And this, this is where everybody starts for Sparrow Fest every year. So and this is the plateau up there. Uh, this is our second canyon. And uh, I don't know why I got a pen going. Sorry about that. Something's marking away over there. Anyway, you can see the diversity. We have a lot of hard oaks or um, hardwoods. And this is also one of the areas where we had a lot of madrones. Um, along with the diversity, you know, like I said, I was documenting everything. We had wild plum. Um, we had the roseate skimmers. Uh, it was everything that we could find we documented and I took pictures of as best as I could. Um, and the variated, um, variegated meadowhawk. I sat one day in a pond and watched the, um, the dragonfly come up from its larval stage and crawl out into where it formed out to be, you know, this checkered sat wing. Took it all day, but it was just fascinating to watch. So, you know, we just, it didn't matter what it was. If we found it, we photographed and tried to ID it. And um, thistles, you know, I know a lot of people don't like thistles on their property, but they really are a really good food source for like the goldfinches and, and other birds when, uh, when they go to seed. So here are some of our, um, we want to call it past rescues. And I saw that Desiree and Ruth Ann were on board. But uh, before we get to them, this um, there was a bad storm that blew in one day and it blew a huge limb onto the roof of my cabin. And uh, one of the employees came down who lived on the ranch to help get the uh, heavy branches off my roof. And while I was picking up all the broken debris, we found this little hummingbird nest. 
and he's on the ladder. We zip tied a soup ladle and we put the nest back in and he's up on the ladder zip tying it back to the branch to where the mother hummingbird continued to feed those babies and I could watch them out of the back window. And they did actually fledge from that nest and uh, you know, survived it. So that was always you know, just one of our goals was to see what, what we could help. And like I said, uh, Ed Soames, he was um, a good friend and Desiree helped him out a lot with a lot of these animal rehabs. And we would take in the ones that uh, a lot of people didn't want or if they didn't have anywhere for them. This is one of the little foxes. There, I think that night that release was three, two or three foxes, I forget. But even after she was released, she'd kind of pop in once in a while when I was sitting down on my porch at the cabin, just kind of like, hey, saying hi. Sometimes she'd just sleep out front. Uh, I have a whole series of photographs where she actually even brought me a, a little cotton rat and kind of like she wanted to trade for what I was eating. Here's one of the other groups. Uh, it was three black vultures that Ed brought in. And so we used to laugh and tell people that if they ever had one land near them, uh, it was just one of Ed's buddies because this one just loved pulling his shoelaces. So we just, you know, the years, all the years I was on the ranch, it was document, document, document. And we just have a, a, a whole bunch of images. There's over 20,000 images in my files of Peaceful Springs alone. This is one of the Lady Tress orchids that we used to find up in the seeps in the second canyon. And I found these little green crab spiders um, kind of, and I just usually only found them on the Lady Tress orchids. And I still haven't ID'd that guy. But this was one of the, the better finds that I had found. It's a um, bromelian uh, longhorn beetle. And I kind of, the, the colorings on it when I found it on the rocks are just Faceted. I mean, they were just neon colors, but he was sitting there and he was actually grooming and cleaning his feet off, which I never thought beetles did. Uh, the other thing was, you know, out roaming around, GPSing black cat vireos in their territories, you know, we'd come across all kinds of critters. The one here on the right was one I found when I was out there and uh, actually was got so close looking face to face with it that it opened its eyes and looked at me. And I can only imagine what it thought when it was staring at me upside down. So we also utilized game cameras. Um, we had them all over the ranch and uh, they would just tell us what was moving around and when, and just always fascinating to find out what would show up on our game cameras. So here's a, we had a rainwater collection area that we had a drip feature for the birds right up in a cluster of junipers. So it gave them cover to come in and the road runners came in along with a lot of other things. We had foxes, a very few deer and because it was a small unit, we didn't have a lot of problem with the hogs on it. Of course, when we started spotting the bluebirds up around the house, we wanted to see if they'd take to the nest boxes. So again, the game cameras told us that they were actually nesting there. So here's one of the other maps that we did and we actually laid out all our golden cheek warbler habitat and then where we were actually hearing the golden cheeks. And again, on the center here, you can see the blue where we had our black cat vireos. So, you know, we had four territories of black cat vireos in the first, you know, two years that we really started getting into this monitoring the endangered species. So we had our little black cat vireo nestlings. Of course, our black cat vireo, which now I hear has been delisted off the endangered species list. Uh, golden cheek warbler. You know, we had anywhere from five to six territories in each canyon every year. And we always kind of, we kept track of when they'd arrive on the ranch. So in my journals, you know, every year it'd be like first golden cheek of the season heard or first black cat vireo herd because mainly that was what Balcones was set aside for was these two birds to protect their habitat in the hill country. So I shared these pictures with Chuck one day. I had found a nest that was actually feeding fledglings and he could look at the bugs that they were feeding the babies and tell what moth 
species it was. And it was the oak roller moth that was, you know, in these, uh, in the in the tree canopies that was just critical for these birds during their uh, their summers in the hill country. Uh, along with, um, you know, our golden cheeks and, and, and all the other really important species, we kept track of harvester ant mounds. I think Ruth Ann came out one day and we did a, uh, a herpetology, we were looking for the horn lizards to see if we actually could find any. And that's why this piece of property is just so critical. We brought in, um, you know, experts that, you know, would be willing to come out and share their information with us. This is uh, Chad Norris from Texas Parks and Wildlife. He was out doing uh, spring studies on private lands and he came out and he looked at all our, our spring fed areas and gave them a water quality grade of like an A plus because of the, uh, the, the great, uh, he was finding um, uh, what I think caddis, caddis flies or stone flies with the, the little cocoons that they make out of the debris from the bottom of the little springs and creeks. Uh, he was tickled. We've also had um, Bill Carr and uh, Jason Singhurst come out and do native plant studies a couple of times. Uh, and they even led workshops later on. This was one of our areas of, you know, where we had our classrooms because we always had a lot of diversity. The turkeys loved it down in this grassland. And there was um, storks bill flowers and uh, plantains, red plantains, little heller plantains, all little things that have seeds for these songbirds. And this was also one of the areas where our cooper hawks like to nest. And Bill, one day on one of his uh, uh, scouting trips, noticed this huge research tree. And he was kind of surprised to see it there because he was explaining to me that it had a very specific soil niche that it liked, which I believe, if I remember right, was a sandy loam. And I kind of laughed. I said, well, I mean, by the size of it, it's been here forever. And we have three others on the ranch. So, you know, we had all these little micro habitats inside of the, the larger ones. And over the years, uh, just running around and finding all this stuff was just like the best job anybody could ever have. Uh, we had one huge area on the back slope of Madrones. And I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to remember who told me that this was a region that normally they aren't found. And I think it's, we were too, and I forget if we were just too far east or west of what they normally are found in, because I know they're found down in South Austin more regular than they are here. Uh, this is one of the areas, and I know we have a lot of madrones because every one of these flags marks a madrone seedling. I actually went out, it took me the better part of a year to mark every madrone, and we had over 598 madrones up on the slope from varying sizes to the massive tree down to these little seedlings. And I think the biggest critical thing that was always our management practices is we never really went in and we cleared out understory. We always left it to protect habitat, give cover for the birds and the other wildlife. So um, Jean Nance and I were walking up one of the canyons and uh, we found the sycamore leaf snowbell, which was a rare endemic in the, um, the hill country in the Edwards Plateau. I'm not sure, I think Kay yesterday was telling me that it might actually be listed as a threatened plant. Uh, I haven't found anything yet on the USDA plant database that says that, so I'm not sure about that. So we're gonna take you, the first Sparrow Fest was in 2005 and it ran until 2011 when the Castleberries moved to Australia. And then we started it again up in 2015 once the Trust for Public Land owned it. And the first, First Sparrow Fest, Bill and Byron came out about an hour before they were supposed to give their presentations. Um, and the first thing they spotted was, of course, the lark bunting in the winter plumage, which they went into that typical birder stance. And I, and I was telling everybody yesterday that the funny thing was, was the Castleberries had never had a tour on the property. So we invited Sparrow Fest to come out so they could see what it involved to open up the ranch to ecotourism. So Bill and Byron immediately, I'm standing there with my journal as Bill and Byron are both rattling off 
all the sparrows that they were seeing right there in the wallaby pen. And it was just amazing and actually funny to watch. And I'm pulling out my journal right now to read it. Um, so they're standing there and immediately Bill starts, you know, lark bunting winter plumage and Byron's black throated sparrow. And I hear lark sparrow, chipping sparrow, field sparrow. Oh my gosh, there's a paraloxia, American goldfinch, house finch, and song sparrow. And it was just, it was kind of funny listening to them rattle down the whole list of birds. So that's, they turned and asked if they could bring out folks for Sparrow Fest. So what I'm going to try to do now is to kind of, um, Get this highlighter anyway to, to take you through what it was kind of virtually like to come on out to the ranch for those of you who hadn't been there. Like Fred said, we usually started at the crack of dawn up at the flying X, it's usually cold, ugly weather. So people are up there at the X, they're getting split out into their groups and they're heading out to the places where they're going to go look for sparrows. So at the ranch, we were always, you know, got ahead of time opened up the gate and had water and anything everybody needed. So as we were waiting, you know, the staff <laughs> and I and the owners would be waiting for the birders to show up. Uh, if anybody who's been there, they know they were always greeted by the ranch dogs. So uh, people would filter out of their cars and almost immediately start finding sparrows. And um, with all the commotion and everything, of course, the neighbors had to come up, see what was going on. But almost immediately, Byron would get people onto the sparrows. And he'd start in with the IDs. And uh, it was always amazing that after all these years, I still have a hard time with sparrow IDs. So uh, I just, I remember him going through, him and Bill and uh, uh, Jeff, always talking about all the different markings. So here we have a Vesper Sparrow. And by all means, I'm not even close to what Byron or any of the others can do, but I re do remember that he always talked about, does it have streaks on the belly? What kind of markings are coming off of the bill? Are there eye rings? Are there marks up around the eyes? Um, are there bars on the wings? And it was all critical. I noticed over all those years that even though all these little brown birds look the same, that really truly they don't. One of the rare ones, the first few years of Sparrow Fest that Bill told me were the only four birds that they found those first few years on Peaceful Springs was the Canyon Towhee, the Lark Bunting in its winter plumage, the Lark Sparrow and the Harris's Sparrow. I think later on they started uh, seeing them more and more in some of the other areas. But here is one of our canyon towhees. This one was always a regular up there around the house and uh, in the old wallaby pens. And I think a lot of that was because that's usually where all the brush was piled up that was clipped around the house and it made a very good cover. We had one too that liked to hang up on the hilltop around the, uh, the old stock tank. But this is, to me, I just never really even noticed the 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 canyon towhees because they were just brown birds. Here's one of the savannah sparrows that used to hang out up there in the pens. Again, you know, I'd hear Byron and Bill talking about the streaking on the chest. If there was a spot, what kind of bars came off of the eyes? Uh, even sometimes the color of the bills always made a big difference. Their other thing was always because we had such a large group of sparrows up there that there was always a good uh, mix of different species. So they would talk about size differences. So we have the Savannah uh, Sparrow sitting next to the White Crown Sparrow. And again, here was another one we had one day. We had the White Crown over here on the left, the Harris Sparrow, which is a little bit bigger than, than the White Crowns. And over here on the right is the uh, first year White Crown Sparrow. Um, it hasn't gotten its um, the, the development of the colors of the black and white on the head yet. So here's a closer uh, picture of the white crown sparrow. I found these guys kind of easy to photograph because they didn't flit around so much and some of the other sparrows used to really drive me crazy. So 
and here's the white crown again from the front. And I always remember see, you know, Byron would say, see, there's no streaking on it, but look at how the bars come out. Um, it was just always constant um, comparisons with other sparrows. Uh, here's the first year again, looking straight on. Now there is, we had uh, one year, we had one of them that had the, the problems with the pigment, pigment not fully developing. And I had it spelled wrong yesterday, but I did look it up and it's, uh, gosh, <laughs> just lost how to say it. Uh, leucism yes. or lucidic. Yeah, lucidic. Um, this one didn't have it as bad, but we had a uh, cardinal up there that had a lot more of the problem with the pigment. I never did see any that had any albinoism that is also talked about with some of the bird species. So here's the field sparrow. Um, to me, it's just like one of those little plain brown birds, but you know, it has this gray up around and a gray around the backside. And uh, just a lot smaller sparrow. I um, never did get any comparison pictures with it with anything, but here's one a little bit closer. And of course, when they're always talking about primary feathers and secondary feathers, of course, it's always nice to have one of the birds out there, you know, accommodate them and spread the wings out while they're talking about it. I actually do think this happened while they were talking about it. That's why I took the picture. We just, we were all kind of laughing that we had trained the birds to do things on command at Peaceful Springs. So here's one of my favorites is the lark sparrow. Uh, it seemed to be pretty much a regular around the ranch all season long. Again, it has very stark markings. So this one was always easy for me to identify with the, with the dark, the very dark black and very streaky and the big spot on the chest. And of course, always um, all the years I've been doing it, Bill and, and uh, Byron and Jeff, we're always, always there with, you know, just all the tips to get people to really get to where they were good at identifying the sparrows. So if it took 15, 20 minutes to sit there and do a comparison. Down here at the springs, we always had, you can see how thick the brush is and how tall the grass is. It always made really good cover. And we always had a lot of different species down here from our fox sparrows to our Harris sparrows. They like that dense coverage. There was always good food, seeds, um, the spotted towhees, you could always hear them shuffling around in the leaf duff down along the edges here, picking up bugs and stuff. And then just on the other side of the, the heavy brush is the, uh, the three springs was really the main reason the name got its ranch. Uh, one season, Byron and I were scouting out the day before and we had the Say's Phoebe show up up there at the house. And we were lucky enough that it stayed there for a couple of days and the folks on that trip, and I forget what year it was, got to actually see that one hanging around. Of course, like every Sparrow Fest, we have really, you know, sometimes we have good weather, sometimes we have bad weather. We don't, we didn't usually bird up at the hilltop because the winds were always so high up there and it was hard for the, the people to see the birds because they really stayed, you know, deep in the brush and they would just move around low on the ground. But I put it in here because I wanted to show you that uh, really the key to even on any of your own properties, whether it's big or small, is the water. And I mean, I can't emphasize water enough, even in the droughts. So Castleberries had set this windmill up to pump into the tank that no matter what, it always had water. The stack came over to the right. But we put in this little man-made trough that when the wind died, that that rainwater or that tank would, we could still drip water into the, the uh, man-made side of it and provide water to the birds that were up on the hilltop. And what this did was, because it was so far from each canyon where all the springs were, it really kept them from having to travel across territories and too far for water. So it was really critical that we had these, um, these little rain, rain, we had a couple of rainwater collection units up there and we had this windmill. And it really, it really changed 
um, the accessibility of water to our wildlife. And as you can see here, you know, yeah, we kept it clear in the front side, mainly for our birds and our photographers, but at least over half of the pond was left in heavy brush. And because of that, we had a large bobwhite quail population that was up there on the hilltop. And they would come into that windmill pretty regularly. And I'm not talking five or six birds. I'm talking seven, eight different coveys of anywhere from five to 15 birds that I had monitored over the years. So, plus the pond always kept other diversity. That was one of the biggest areas. We had dragonflies, frogs, and a lot of our amphibian species. It was also where we spotted the black throat sparrow a lot. It liked that heavy brush, but uh, they were also spotted up around the house. So, of course, we have the savanna sparrow, and you can see the smud. So he was one of our regular visitors up there at that little pond. Uh, I have a whole series of him splashing around, having a good time in the water. And of course, the savanna sparrow is, uh, it's one of those ones I have problems with with some of the other birds because there's, uh, the, I think, the savanna, the song, and the Lincolns that look so similar to me that I probably had a few of them misidentified. We had talked about it yesterday. So I'm hoping I got the identification straight today, but I think in the question and answers, if somebody finds out I didn't, they'll let me know. So here's one of the Savannah spirit, you know, again, Bill and Byron and Jeff talking about the streaking in the spots, uh, the colors of the bill is a ring going around the eye, through the eye, all kinds of, all little tidbits that over the years I kept hearing them talk about. So we had our meadow larks also that pretty, pretty much hung out up on the hilltops. But one day I had one sitting on this, the fence and I took a picture of it and I had identified it as a grasshopper sparrow because that's all I heard is yellow over the eye, yellow over the eye. But I was looking at this, getting ready for this presentation and I'm looking at this bird going, oh, wait a minute, that beak is awful long to be a grasshopper sparrow. So I started checking into it. Sure enough, it was a meadow lark. I couldn't tell you if it was an Eastern or a Western. I'm not that good with those kind of um, just the subtle differences between the two species, but it is a meadow lark. Because here is the grasshopper sparrow that was on the fence line a little further down the road. And again, it, it has some yellow, but it has more yellow over the eyes than the, uh, the meadow lark did. But as a photographer, those are things that I, I hate to say it, I don't pay attention into it in the field because I can get a picture of it and I can always go back later and ID it. So here he is putzing around on the fences and the wind fluffing up the feathers. But again, you know, yellow over the eye and the beak. The beak isn't nearly as long as that meadow larks. Uh, plus the size difference, there was a good size difference on it. So up at the windmill too, we had these dick sissels that would show up every now and then. I think they're moving further west more and more than they used to in the early days. There we go. So they, why am I getting, sorry about that. Why am I getting these highlighter pens in there? Hmm. Sorry about that. I don't know why it's highlighting. So. Okay. So again, this is, I apologize. I don't know why it won't let me erase all the ink or why it's even doing it. So here's a group, you know, again, a lot of our Sparrow Fest, really, we spent time up around the house, around the pens and down here at the springs because that was always the best birding. Um, here's Byron. Uh, he was always quick to run into the brush and point out the birds for those that had a hard time spotting them. And you could hear him down there always telling, okay, so no, look at the streaking on the chest. Does it have this? Does it have that? So another group that uh, over the years we had, I think this group actually, uh, I'm trying to remember what they spotted. I uh, should have had it in my journals. Anyway, down in the springs, we had the fox sparrow. That seemed to be the one habitat was where we found it. And this one, uh, we don't know. It has some kind of a parasite problem. I never did find out what it was. 
Some people say it's from feeders, but the birds on Peaceful Springs, we didn't have feeding locations out except at the house because the Castleberries liked watching the birds, so they would spread it on the ground. We never had uh, bird feeders hanging. But for me, the fox sparrow was one of the ones that was easy to ID because it was bright, rusty, red with a lot of streaking and its head was gray. Plus it's a pretty big bird. And my other favorite was you know, Byron or Bill be in the woods and they'd be like, oh, look, do you see that bright red eye? Can you tell what it is? Can anybody guess? Well, it's our spotted towhee. We did have an Eastern towhee there one year that Bill spotted, but I never did get a picture of it. And uh, they have, uh, they're, they're much larger, about the size of a mockingbird. So when they're with the other sparrows, they're pretty easy to, to pick out, just even with the red eye and the dark heads. This is the female, and you've noticed her, the head isn't as dark as the males. We got our clay colored sparrow. Again, the amount of streaking, but just looking at the pictures and setting this up, I've noticed that the clay colored sparrows seem to have this patch of gray more on the back of their neck. And then the, there's a white band that comes down and that one streak coming off of the eye. So here's Lincoln Sparrow, uh, a lot of rusty color. Again, Byron, I hear Byron in my head going, look at the streaking on the chest, look at it around the neck, look at the color patterns, the differentiations. Um, there seems to be that rusty band on most of them on Peaceful Springs. Uh, when we get to the question and answers, I'll show you all the book that I use. It's for photographers. And it's amazing the, uh, the amount of differences there are between just one, one species of sparrow. So again, here's the Lincoln Sparrow up close. Um, Dark-eyed Junco um, was uh, one, of, one of the areas that we would see that a lot of them would be down there at the pavilion in the pond. Sometimes we'd spot them up at the hilltop by the house. And here's one, I don't know if it's a female and it's just because she has a lighter head or if it's just one that um, just didn't get as dark of a head. Here's another one of my favorites is the Harris Sparrow. Come on, my uh, pointers quit working. Anyway, sorry, it's just jumping around. I can't get the... Uh, pointer to work or the mouse to work. So, anyway, the, uh, come on, I don't want to leave. I want to use my pointer. So, anyway, um, I'm sorry, I can't point out the markings, but you can see the, the black, it's kind of like a, a skid streak right up over the, the top of the head. I believe this is one of the first year that didn't get uh, get the dark head yet. Um, this was one of the other ones that we would uh, spot up on the hilltop by the house was our white-throated sparrow. You can see that nice big bright white patch and from the backside. Uh, to me, they always look like little wrens until they turn their heads and I can see them. If I if I can't see the head, a lot of times I might just dismiss them as a little, a little Buick's wren or canyon wren. Some of our other visitors, yellow rump warblers would pop around. Now here is where I think I may have an ID wrong, but I'm not positive. This one I had as a song sparrow, because uh, to me, it still kind of looks like a Lincoln sparrow, but it's just not as um, streaky, but I'm hoping I have it right as a song sparrow. They also like to be, uh, they were mostly down around the, the springs. With our uh, field sparrows, they were up on the hilltop around the house. Um, we used to have uh, you know, large numbers of them up around there. And there were smaller groups that would be down around the springs. Ah, got my pointer back. So again, um, you can see the wing bars. There's a little bit of a white difference in there. So. But I'm hoping that all of you next year will 
have a chance to get into the Sparrow Fest and actually be out in the field with Byron, Bill, and Jeff and actually really get in there and start looking at, you know, all these differences. Here we go. So this is the Rufus Crown Sparrow. Um, I've got next is the Chipping Sparrow. And I always used to get those confused until I really started looking. And uh, Fred pointed it out to me yesterday. So here's the Rufus Crown but it doesn't have, come on. Uh, well, this is a, a chipping sparrow, but it's, uh, I think it's a first year. That's why it doesn't have the distinct markings, but here's a chipping sparrow. And this is what Fred pointed out to me yesterday was how the black line runs all the way through the eye. And then there's that nice white patch because for a long time, I used to look at this bird and the other one and think they were all Rufus crown sparrows. So here's just a, a early morning view from in front of my cabin of one of the chipping sparrows that like to come down to the little water feature I had by the cabin. And um, one of our most secretive birds that was on the Sparrow Fest, and I think at this point of all the participants, Terry Friggle, forget, God, I'm sorry, Terry, I, don't, I can't pronounce your last name. He was the only other person that I can remember that spotted the American woodcock down there at the springs. I know we had spent some time looking at him or trying to find them, but Terry was the only one that actually got binoculars on him one day. So, uh, but he was always a good, uh, a good little visitor down around the cabin. And for those, oh, those of you who've been out with Bill, you always know that he's like the last one to leave the field and head back to the flying X. And every time late in the afternoon, I mean, it'd be six o'clock, people are supposed to be back from dinner. And here's Bill with everybody getting that one last look at probably the white-throated sparrow or black-throated sparrow. And, you know, they just, just don't want to leave. So I put this up for comparison because a chipping sparrow is also one of our regulars that hang around because um, this is now spring because of the painted bunting that's uh, down there around the springs. We always had a good number of them. Plus, if I have the time, um, I have a, a little series of some of our other visitors. And I'm sorry about that streaking, but it won't let me shut off. Karen, you have time. Go ahead and show us our other visitors. OK, because I don't know how those markings got there. I never had a highlight pen, so anyway. So here are some of our other regular visitors. Uh, that were always um, fun to watch. Sparrow Fest for a couple of years, we had a Bearden that was up there on the hilltop. So that uh, I think made a nice find for a lot of people on Sparrow Fest. The bush tit was one that um, I found, it was up on the, um, the edges of the golden cheek warbler habitat and the hilltop habitat of the black cat vireo one spring. And it was really kind of odd. We had a whole bunch of them up there but I never saw them after that one season. It seemed like they just disappeared that following year and never came back. Um, I did a big sit one day down at my cabin at my water feature, and I counted 19 birds that I had never seen before. One of them was the Northern Perula had come in. I had the chestnut-sided warbler come in. And this was all in one day. I just sat there on my porch all day with my camera aimed at the water feature waiting had the black and white warbler. I've gotten pictures of these guys way up in the trees, but I've never, this was the first time I got one close enough down that I finally got a good picture of it. Then of course, the water feature that got shared by the hooded warbler, the Nashville warbler and the yellow warbler. Uh, they were all bouncing around, flitting around because I don't know if anybody remembers the cabin, those that had been there that there was minimal clearing around the cabin. It was pretty much nestled up right into the, the understory of the forest and the and the bushes and it was always left pretty heavy with vines, small shrubs and trees. I had a yellow warbler come in and this was all in that one day visit. Uh, these guys though, they were pretty, uh, they were regulars during our spring and summer, the indigo bunting and the lazuli bunting. Of course the summer tanager, they kind of hung out on and off through the early spring, summer on the ranch. One night I was sitting on my porch and I kept hearing this weird shuffling noise. 
and I popped the flash on my camera and this little guy was sitting there hunting the uh, rat snake that liked to hang around the back door. One day Chad called me and he says, hey, I got this weird red bird up here at the house. So I got up there and it was the vermilion flycatcher and he showed up on and off over the years. Down at the pond, we had a lesser yellow legs that once in a while would show up. Um, one day I was driving down the road and of course I got this video of the, the road runner out there hunting grasshoppers. Um, it was one of the first times I'd ever really gotten to see the road runner up close. He actually kind of trotted towards the truck at one point and I thought, what in the world are you up to? Because I don't have grasshoppers on my bumper. But he was catching them for his girl. And I must have spent two or three hours watching him run up and down that road eating grasshoppers. So over the years on Peaceful Springs, you know, we went through some pretty bad droughts and of course some pretty bad storms. But we always looked forward to the rain because that's what recharged all the springs and our, our little seeps and uh, always provided all the nice water for our wildlife. And um, this is one of the rainwater collections that I made that could be transported around in a pickup truck that we could locate it where we needed it. But the thing was, was once, once we set water up, we didn't want wildlife that if they were gonna get used to it, that if we had to take it down, that we had to slowly you know, back off on the water so they would start searching elsewhere. We didn't just shut it off and take it away. We always had yearly migrations. This is one of my favorite was all the white pelicans would fly over every year and they would come up the canyon. And I'm not sure if they came up off of Lake Travis, but they always seemed to come up just right over the roof and they would start kettling to clear up and get a higher elevation to get over up onto the plateau of the ranch. We always had uh, the whooping cranes and there was always, I think a straggler or two of the, uh, well, the whooping cranes, but these are the sandhill cranes, but Sometimes I would look in the back and I'm not sure and never got a good enough picture of them that the whooping cranes would be kind of following behind in small little clusters. Of course, every season we had a lot of ducks when the pond was holding its water. Uh, we had redheads, we had ringnecks, we had shovelers, we had all kinds of ducks. So anyway, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. I miss, miss living on the ranch and I miss the refuge. But I hope the main thing is that water, water, water and cover. If you have property, it doesn't matter if you live on an acre, half an acre, if you have hundreds of acres. Leaving brush, I, I know we like to clean it up and we like it to look manicured and nice, but that's not wildlife. That's not what they like. They like it thick. And I know it brings in snakes and other things, but that's what makes the habitat that the animals like. And that's pretty much what we kind of did at Peaceful Springs. There were very few areas that we cleaned out. So anyway, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Karen. What a beautiful presentation. I, mean, I just get excited about it. I'm, I'm glad Byron is out there able to see it right now. And I was watching some of these chat questions uh, and we're not going to, I'm going to let Jennifer lead us in that, but Peaceful Springs is one of our closed tracks, but uh, we'll be running some uh, trips in the future up there. It'll be a friends only type thing. It's very limited access, but uh, chances to get to see that beautiful area. And the neat thing is our whole refuge is a beautiful area, but Peaceful Springs really just sits out there like a, like a beacon in, in, in the darkness of a wonderful, wonderful place yeah. with those canyons and everything. Uh, Jennifer, we got a question. Let's do about 10 minutes of questions. I don't know if we can get everybody's in there. And uh, if you have other ones, you can send emails to the Friends of Balconies and we will try to get you some answers to your questions. Karen, you might want to stop your screen share. Uh, I thought I did. How do you, how do you, yeah, in the bottom mm. middle of your screen, there should be a button that says stop screen sharing. Um, I actually don't have meeting controls. They're only up at the top. Okay, I think I can stop you if I... 
because I have totally lost the screen. All I've got is two little windows on. Oh, I got sorry. it. There we go. I got I've got it. I've got some questions for you, Karen. I just wanted to let you know also, everybody in the chat is saying your pictures are amazing. What a wonderful presentation and thanking you, um, thank you. for it. Okay, so first question I have for you from Betsy. She asks, what is the effect of drought on the number of sparrows? Well, that's probably something more Byron could answer, but I noticed on Peaceful Springs, and it wasn't just sparrows, but drought really affected them. Um, even our black cat vireos that back in 2009, we had a researcher, when he GPSed all the black cat vireos, we had the windmill putting water out, but we didn't have anything at the other side of the hilltop. So his GPS marks actually started showing a horseshoe shape on the top of the, the hilltop. So the birds were keeping territories along the sides where they could get down into the springs and the little creeks, but there was nothing up in the center of the hilltop on the other side of the ranch. So that's where we put one rainwater collection. And that following year, we had Texas A&M come out and they found 16 territories and they had finally evened back out on the hilltop. So that's when we noticed just how critical water was just for the black cat vireos, but it was also critical for all the other wildlife. Thank you. Are there still quail at Peaceful Springs or do you know if uh, prescribed burning has impacted them? I can't answer because I don't know if they've burned Peaceful Springs, but when I left in 2018, uh, um, we had at least four or five coveys and there was one covey that we flushed out up in that first canyon up off a of beard track that had 22 birds at a best guess and that was John Harrington was with me and he was actually out doing quail counts with uh who was it they had a couple of transects up on some other uh, tracks of the refuge and but they weren't finding one or two birds so John was absolutely floored that just that one covey had over 20 quail. But again, up around the house, there were troughs. There used to be wallabies there, so and a horse. So there were always water troughs that were available to the to the wildlife. So mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, as far as I know, 2008 when I left, I haven't been back. So I, I don't know if there's still quail up there. Yeah, I will have to look into that. Um, <clears throat> the hillsides are forested and there's an area with few trees. Do you know why? Betsy asks. She asked this uh, when you were doing the overview photo of the ranch. The hillsides were forested, but the side, I mean, that maybe yeah, it might be what she was looking at. there was an area with few trees. Um, That's probably the flying X where they burn that hilltop about every three years. Uh, if it was off to the right, if I remember, it was an open grassland. If there was yeah, any was, major, yeah, that was flying X or beard. It, the way they burn it, it, they keep it as an open grassland savanna on the areas they burn. Awesome. Thank you. Do you know if there's ever been horned lizards on Peaceful Springs? James asks. Um, we found the scat and Ruth Ann, she was with uh, her logical group and came out with Carol, oh, I can't think of her last name now, bless her heart. They came out and did a survey because I had actually mailed her scat that I found that had red ants, harvester ants in it, and it had that typical white capping on it. So she was pretty sure that there probably was a horn lizard. So we put some game cameras out on a couple of the red ant mounts hoping to spot them. We never did find them, but I would not be surprised if they weren't there, at least a few of them, because it's just perfect habitat. That one map, you saw all the harvester ant mounds that had been GPSed on the hilltop. So we certainly had food source for them in the cover form, but. Awesome. You referenced a book in your presentation. Can you um, oh. say what it was again? Yeah. Um, here we go. Sparrows of the United States and Canada. Apparently the fuzzing in the background is messing it up. There we go. It's a photographic guide to sparrows. And I like it because, and I marked the page just because it shows the song sparrow, which is the one I seem to have a lot of, a lot of problems with. And I don't know, I think I'm gonna have to shut off that background fuzz or something. 
or maybe come a little, try coming a little closer to the, to the camera, maybe. There, no, yeah, yeah, it's not gonna work. Well, now I have to, I think I have to go into that background. Whoop, where to go? I'm just, I'm gonna spotlight you so people can see you a little better. Oh, uh, maybe that'll help. Oh, no. no. No, I knew I shouldn't have messed with the background. It was the first time I tried to do it. Oh, Byron has said in the chat that it's out of print now, but you can find that book at half price books. Yeah, it's, um. well, maybe I can move it up slow and get it, but you can, ooh. no, <laughs> it does, there okay. we, yeah, part of it anyway. There you go. You can see a couple of them. It just shows all the different markings from just one song sparrow species. It's not going to let okay, me Okay, I have one last steady. question for you. Mm -hmm. um, it is a big one. What is the impact of climate change on different types of sparrows from Bill? I That I can't answer because I don't know enough about the bird species. I know over the years we've been seeing some shifts like the dick sissels spending more time over past I-35, more to the west. So there's been some shift of different species. I know one year we had the sage thrasher show up at the ranch, which was a rare, um, a rare find that everybody got really tickled about. But I'm not sure, I, I honestly, I couldn't answer that one. I, I know that there's been a shift. We have crested caracara a couple of years before I left there that were nesting in that first canyon, which are I know are a South Texas bird, but when I first got here, I was starting to see a couple of them over there by the Chinook deck. And that pair, their offspring have been spreading out in the area. So the last couple of years I was there, we had the, the crested caracara hanging out regularly around the ranch. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's something that we're still studying and trying to figure out the effects yeah. of climate change on all of these species. That Those are all the questions I have for you. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Karen. Sure too. Yep. Stay handy because with, with Byron on here, you know, it, it's good to see an old friend there. But uh, can we uh, unmute Byron? Or is Byron unmuted? Iron stone. I will work on him in just a second. Let me make sure I can, let me find you. We're going to be bringing I'm on. Can you hear me now? We yes, can. sir. Testing, Absolutely. testing. This is the sparrow countdown. 10, 9. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, good. Y'all want an image or, or no image? Video? If you want to do it, see if an image would work, we'd love to have an image, Byron. Okay. Hi guys, uh, hello from the Flying X, uh, uh, Sparrow Man here with Randy Pink Note Pinkson. Hi everybody. And Jeff Tohey Boy Patterson. And uh, it's great to know that all of y'all are out there. And, uh, and uh, thank you, Karen, for the wonderful, wonderful photographs. I thought they were fantastic. Uh, lots of great bird photos and uh, and habitat photos. So we're here. Thanks, I miss you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. What? Where are you at now, Karen? I am what living over here in East Texas, and oh, I've been helping God. out at the Natchez River National Wildlife oh. Refuge. I see. Nice. So. Okay. All right. Well. Um, I'll uh, I'll uh, address some of the questions that were asked, at least to, to the degree that I can, and um, and I'll give you guys a sparrow uh, countdown, and also give you a view out here from the flying X. That's some habitat out there. Uh, you can see off across the hills there is um, uh, grassland here. There's lots of native grasses here. Native grasses are, are good for native birds. So if you want good sparrows, you look for good grasses and we got them here. And then in the, in the canyons, you may be able to see there the, the green of the cedar trees and live oaks, uh, uh, ash, juniper, but here in Texas, most uh, native Texans call them cedar trees. The ash, juniper, and live oaks are green and those are in the 
in the in the steep uh, in the more in the steep canyons than on the on the tops of the mesas or hillsides here. So um, uh, Randy and Jeff and I were out um, birding this morning. We birded three areas of the refuge that uh, we would normally bird on Sparrow Fest. And unfortunately, you know, because of the pandemic, we, we weren't able to safely uh, take other people with us. But that means that more of you get to hear about the Sparrow Report than usual because, because even uh, non-pandemic Sparrow Fest is a little bit of an exclusive thing. Uh, it's not because we don't want to share it with uh, a lot of people, but because we just don't have uh, a whole lot of room um, for uh, to to have presentations and to sit down. We usually have a have a little lunch or people bring their lunches, and there are just so many people that we can have here, and there are only so many people that you can take on a field trip and give everybody a, a decent chance to see the birds that we find. So in central Texas, uh, in, in the winter, and Fred, remind me, how much time? How much time have I got here? You got a good 10 minutes. 10, we'll give you 10 to 15 minutes. We'll work out perfect, Byron. Ten, 10 more minutes? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay, 10 more minutes. Okay. So here in central Texas, um, in the winter, so basically from mid-November to uh, early March, on any given day in Central Texas, there are 20 different sparrow species that can, that can be seen uh, conceivably in one day, 20 native sparrows. And uh, so what we do, and, and Central Texas is particularly a particularly good place because, because it's a conversion of biomes. We have the, here at the Flying X and the Peaceful Springs, which is just a couple of miles away. In fact, there's a a shared fence line between the Flying X property and Peaceful Springs. But <clears throat> this is on the Edwards Plateau in, uh, in Burnett County. But just about 15 to 20 miles east of here, uh, we drop off of the plateau and, uh, and we're in uh, either riparian habitat along the Colorado River or in the Blackland Prairie habitat that's uh, East of, uh, east of the plateau in central Texas. And so these two different biomes bring in uh, slightly different bird species. Also, since uh, Texas here, central Texas is mid-continent, we get a few birds <clears throat> in central Texas regularly that are not very often found on either coast, like Harris's sparrow, one of the sparrows that we missed this morning, but that is one of the 20 regularly occurring winter sparrows in central Texas. And they're around this year, uh, but not in the, uh, maybe the numbers seem a little bit lower this year than most years, but Harris's sparrow is a bird that breeds in the tundra of uh, Northern Canada and far, far, far Northeastern Alaska and then comes down and spends, uh, spends the winter as far south as South Central Texas. And so we're, at, but only in the middle of the continent. They don't really go to the East Coast and they don't go to the West Coast. And then we're also, we have a little bit of Southwestern influence. So um, we don't really have Chihuahuan desert habitat here, but we're not very far from it. And there are some Southwestern specialty birds like black-throated sparrow that we get here in the Austin checklist area and here at Flying X and Peaceful Springs that are hard to find any very far east of here. So this morning we went out and we had a pretty good day. Uh, I know that one of the questions that Fred asked was, what's the worst weather that we've ever had for Sparrow Fest? And the worst weather basically is very, very windy. Uh, that's really worse. That makes it hard to find birds, makes it hard to hear them and uh, just makes it really hard. So. Wind is almost worse than rain. Rain and wind uh, is the worst. This morning we had pretty good weather actually. Very little wind. It was a little bit of mist early on and it was uh, overcast, but no wind. So we could hear the birds, especially uh, Toey Boy with his uh, young, uh, very uh, capable ears, was able to hear lots of good birds. And, uh, and we had good weather. Pretty, pretty good numbers of birds, not, uh, maybe not the most that uh, we've ever seen, uh, but pretty good numbers. So we started off the morning before dawn. Uh, Jeff heard a, uh, 
Canyon, um, I'm sorry, uh, Rufus Crown Sparrow singing here. That's one of three plateau specialty birds that uh, can usually be seen here either at the Flying X or at Peaceful Springs. Uh, uh, Rufus Crown Sparrow, Canyon Toey, and Black Throated Sparrow. So uh, we, we heard and then later saw Rufus Crown Sparrow, our second bird uh, this morning, I think it was a grasshopper sparrow that Jeff heard singing. And we eventually found five or six grasshopper sparrows. Our third bird, I believe, was a spotted toey. I think our first, fourth bird was uh, actually a black-throated sparrow. And then we added uh, Savannah and Vesper sparrows for five and six. We had uh, a number of white-crowned sparrows. White-crowned sparrows, one of the three zonotrichia species that occur regularly in winter in central Texas. And uh, we had a lot of white-crowned sparrows this morning. Um, and oftentimes Harris's sparrows hang out with the white crown sparrows, but we didn't get any Harris's sparrows this morning. And um, let me see. Uh, then, well, we had uh, Leconte sparrow. We had Leconte sparrow, a couple of, and, and Leconte sparrow is another mid-continent specialty bird. Doesn't breed quite as far north as Harris's sparrow does, but uh, they winter in central Texas and down on the, on the, uh, uh, central and upper coast of Texas. We had Leconte Sparrow. Uh, nine was Song Sparrow. Did I mention Vesper and Savannah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Nine was Song Sparrow. Come on, come on. Uh, ten was... Lincoln Oh, yeah, Field Sparrow. Eleven was Lincoln Sparrow. And we had one other here. We left with twelve. Oh, oh, the big one of the morning. Jeff and I got a great look at a male eastern toey here. Oh, wow. So uh, uh, here at uh, Flying X, unfortunately, Randy did not get on that bird. We tried real hard to get it to come back, pop back out. Uh, uh, eastern toey is uh, the, the least abundant and least widespread of our 20 regularly occurring sparrows. Um, so we left Flying X with 12 species. We headed, uh, after spending about an hour and a half here, about 8.30, we headed over to Peaceful Springs. Peaceful Springs is a great spot for canyon towie. It's the largest of our towies. We did add canyon towie over there. Then we went down to the springs proper. Uh, we saw a great, uh, we saw a male Cooper hawk, Cooper's hawk displaying and then calling repeatedly. And then we saw a Cooper's hawk pair later fly out. They're not sparrows, they don't count as sparrows. Uh, but we added white-throated sparrow. We had several white-throated sparrows down at the spring, several fox sparrows, and we added uh, dark-eyed junco uh, for our 16th sparrow of the morning. We tried, tried, tried to get lark sparrow, chipping sparrow, uh, swamp sparrow, and Harris's sparrow, but we haven't found them yet. We think we've got a pretty good spot this afternoon for swamp sparrow, and we've got spots that are where on along Cow Creek Road where we have had uh, lark sparrows and uh, chipping sparrows and even occasionally Harris's sparrows. So we got a chance to get 20. And if we can get one of what I call the bonus birds, if we could get a green-tailed toey or a clay-colored sparrow or a lark bunting, or this year we've had an influx of, of birds that normally winter much farther west, so west of the Pecos River or further west than that, and brewer sparrows have been showing up. If we could get any one of those, we could even get uh, over 20 species. But that's what we have so far uh, today. It's been a great morning, and I want to thank um, uh, Jennifer Brown and the rest of the uh, refuge staff for allowing us to access uh, these properties, and, and thank you, Fred. Uh, for everything you do for friends. And I want to encourage all of you, I want to let you know, one of the greatest threats that faces birds everywhere is habitat loss and destruction. And you can make a donation to friends and help us uh, buy more properties eventually, help the, the, the feds the, and, and the National Wildlife Refuge System acquire more properties like Peaceful Springs because friends helped out in a big way in the acquisition of Peaceful Springs. So please, please, please donate something, whatever you can, be generous if you can, um, and, uh, and help out um, uh, Balconies Canyonlands Refuge and help the birds.
Thank you. I'll I'll take oh let me take a couple of questions I heard earlier. What is drought like for the birds and what is drought like for sparrows? So drought is hard on almost everybody. Black throated sparrow is a bird of the southwestern deserts in the United States. It gets as far west as um, southeastern California. And black throated sparrow can survive without uh, any surface water, but even black throated sparrows need to eat. And if there's not enough rain for uh, plants to, to make flower for the grasses and make flowers to set seeds or for the shrubs to make leaves and for them for little caterpillars to come on the leaves and for the black throated sparrows to get the caterpillars, it's even hard for black throated sparrows. So drought is hard on everything. Climate change is gonna be hard on everybody, everybody. There will be a few winners in cl climate change and the winners among humans will be people like, you know, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, and uh, a lot of the rest of us are gonna be losers. And that's uh, the same thing in the bird world. There will be a few winners in a bird world with climate change, but there can be a lot of losers. And one of the main things to keep in mind about climate change is it is true that there has been, I think it's true that there's been as much carbon in the atmosphere, in, you know, 300 million years ago or something like that as there is now. But what's different about human caused climate change is it has happened in the span of a few human lifetimes. And that makes it very hard for creatures, including humans, to adapt and that's one of the major, major issues facing all um, humankind and, and all terrestrial life over the next uh, several decades. Uh, what other questions are there? Well, but before, before we let Byron get off and we'll let Jennifer, if she can find any questions in there. Okay. I just wanted to point out to the crowd, this is the 17th Sparrow Fest and Byron Stone, Doc, Doc Stone is the reason that we've had 17 Sparrow Fest. And his crew, Randy, Jeff, uh, Bill Reiner, Bill Reiner mm -hmm. and past people that have taken part in it, they've given their heart and soul. Yes, they, they love birds, absolutely. And they love getting people on birds and teaching you about birds. But uh, it, it's the environment. It, it's the neat area we got. So. Following mm -hmm. up with Byron, there, there's a link uh, in the chat to the Friends of Balconies. There is a donate, donate button on it. We'd certainly appreciate a donation to help us. Uh, Sparrow Fest is usually a fundraising event for us. So if you can help us out financially, mm -hmm. that would be great. But also we, we could use help, the friends could use help. We need, uh, you could just join us, learn more about us, do, do some of our fun, activities. You can help volunteer with our activities. Uh, we do environmental education with uh, school children. Uh, we were doing 2,500 or so under the guidance of Jennifer uh, before the pandemic. Uh, one of the neat things that we're really not pushing here or, or letting people know, the Friends have gone through a strategic planning process and uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the friends have gone through a strategic planning process and our short-term goal is we are hoping to bring on an executive director maybe the third or fourth quarter of 2021. We want to make the friends a conservation-minded or organization out there sharing the beauty out of, of the nature and really one of the things that really catches me with it is we want to make that next generation of conservation heroes because we got to get the kids turned on to all the fun stuff that, that all of us adults out there are having. So Jennifer, do you have any other questions in the chat that Dr. Stone could might need to answer? Yeah, I have just a couple, a couple questions. So are do you use eBird as one? Do you post your birds to eBird? Byron, you may need to unmute yourself. Yes, we we all use eBird. We're eBird addicts. Excellent. Hard, hardcore. <laughs> okay. Um, someone, uh, Maria asked, I have read in recent research that the number of sparrows is in serious decline across the country. Does that match your experience? 
Well, birds in general uh, are in decline. I mean, again, there are a few winners. Uh, great tailed grackles uh, seem to be, you know, among the winners. Um, but yeah, birds everywhere. Now, you might be, people may have heard about the house sparrow in Great Britain that's been uh, in serious decline over the last decade or so. House sparrows do, um, they do inhabit uh, this continent, but that's because some uh, people back in the late 1800s or early 1900s brought them from Europe to New York City and turned a bunch of them loose, thinking it would be a great idea. Um, but uh, house sparrows now inhabit most of the continental U.S. But uh, so the sparrows that are in decline are uh, grass, you know, since sparrows are grassland birds and grasslands, native grassland habitats are among the most threatened in uh, most parts of the world, including North America. Yes, sparrows are in decline. There are a few winners and a few that are kind of holding their own, but but it's it's tough on uh, on a lot of birds. Habitat loss, habitat loss and climate change and uh, hazards like uh, collisions with uh, with buildings and then uh, you know it's it's tough yeah thank you thanks for that you also uh inadvertently answered the next question was if um house sparrows were found in the hill country <laughs> so yes they are yes yeah, so, uh, house sparrows they they kind of live up to their name they really like to be around uh, human habitation that's not one of the 20 that's not a native sparrow so we don't count it as one of our 20 sparrow species on the refuge there are not many house sparrows and although there used to be some uh at the at, at peaceful springs the people who uh who own the property uh and lived there previously before the refuge acquired it had some um uh bird houses that and the house sparrows have taken them over but i think that refuge personnel have taken care of that and i don't think we heard or saw any house sparrows this morning which yeah, we actually, count that as a good thing actually By byron we we yes. targeted house sparrows early on so yeah. they were part of our cowbird catchment and we, yeah, okay. we eradicated them a while ago your secret is safe with me that's a we, private joke that's a semi-private uh, joke now, Texas Parks and Wildlife told us we were supposed to. No, 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 I understand. I That's good. I, I think it's a good thing. Well, thank you, Byron. We have folks in the chat thanking you so much and saying um, overall welcome. thank you for having a virtual Sparrow Fest because they would not have been able to attend otherwise. So Yeah, I understand. I'm glad, glad you were able to attend that way. Now, I will send a, a summary list of... Um, you know, the birds that, uh, the sparrows that we got today to Fred, so he can email it out, out to you guys. You know, I don't know if it'll be this evening or, or maybe tomorrow before the Super Bowl, so everybody can study it before the Super Bowl. Yeah. Okay. We'll that so Byron, did you have, how many sparrows did you have this morning? We had 16 sparrow species this morning. Then I must, have, I must have one too many. Somebody had asked yeah, we had. I'll tell, so I'll, I'll name them again. We had Savannah and Vesper Sparrow. We had Lincoln's and Song Sparrow. We had White-Crowned and White-Throated Sparrow. That's six. We had rufous Crown Sparrow. We had um, Canyon Towie, Eastern Towie, Spotted Towie. That's 10. We had Grasshopper and Leconte Sparrow. That's 12. We had Dark Eyed Junko. Fox Sparrow, missing two. Field. Field Sparrow. So I said the, I said, no, we didn't have, we missed Chipping. Chipping would probably get along Cow Creek uh, Road. I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm missing one myself right now. We had 16. You got 16 with your Eastern Toey. I counted 16, I think. Yeah, Eastern Toey. Yeah, Eastern Toey. Yeah, we had three towies this morning. We're hoping maybe we'll get a green tail towie the rest of the day, but Flying X is the best spot for that. Wonderful. Wonderful, Byron. Thank you. Thank for you.
Thank, thank you for all. checking in. Thank you for all the work you're doing. And we will thank hopefully you. we will be in person next year. And thank you, Jennifer, for allowing us access to otherwise closed uh, parts of the refuge. We are so happy to be a part of this event and helping to bring awareness to sparrows and the uniqueness of the refuge. So yes. happy, to, happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Yes. All right. Y'all take care. Have a good. Thank you, Byron. Adios. Paula, do you have any closing remarks you want to make? As <laughs> no, I, boy saying I think we're good. Uh, the only thing yeah, I would everybody. say to people, uh, if you want to be on the mailing list for future events, uh, receive our newsletter and connect with us. Uh, there's a form that you can uh, fill out. It's very simple. Your name, your email address, and then there's one question which asks you how often you get out to the refuge. But thanks everyone for coming. This is so exciting. This has been such a successful event. I'm looking forward to our next one. Back to you, Fred. Well, I'm just gonna say thanks for everybody attending. Uh, next year, when Sparrow Fest gets announced, we basically have about 32 openings. Uh, and Sarah Allen's got the Sparrows of the United States and, and Canada. Uh, Sparrow Fest is open. Uh, we usually announce it early November and we usually have a waiting list in about two or three weeks. Uh, it was great to see all, the, so just, you'll get an announcement when it opens. I, I, I'm comfortable, hopefully we will have it. And I just wanna thank everybody for attending. I saw Master Naturalist, people in the Highland Lakes Birding and Wildflower Society. I saw some TOS members in there. I saw some, uh, Georgia Schwartz from down in San Antonio. Just wonderful to see all these names we know and really want to thank everybody for supporting us. Join the friends. We need members. We would love to have you join us. We'd love to have you volunteer with us. And if you could help us out financially to secure some property, that, that would be wonderful also.